we are more than delighted to welcome you know, Professor Manish Parashar from the University of Utah. So Manish is the Director of Scientific Computing and Imaging at Sci Institute there. Uh, he's also a Presidential Professor at the School of Computing at the University of Utah. And he'll be talking to us about uh, a translational perspective on end-to-end -end workflows. And again, thank you so much, Manish. I really appreciate you uh, adopting the schedule to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rafael, and thank you. This is my first time as part of this community, and it's just amazing to see how it's come together. Uh, thanks for your leadership. Uh, I attended some of the talks yesterday and enjoyed the discussions. I put this up in a in a hurry, so I apologize for that. Uh, hopefully, it's coherent. Uh, what I want to do here is to talk about uh, some an idea that David Abramson and I have been pushing around translational uh, computer science research and then you know, see how it applies to some work we've been doing on end-to-end -end scientific workflows. So I'll start by just setting the stage on translational computer science research. Uh, and it really started uh, from a conversation at David Abramson, uh, who's at University of Queensland, and I had a couple of years back now where we were trying to, you know, we were coming out from a session and, and trying to understand, you know, what, what connects all the work uh, that was presented there and, 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 you know, how does it fit into what we're doing? And, and part of that conversation, this idea of translational computer science is a way of describing something that all of us or, or many of us have been doing, right? And understanding, uh, you know, what, what are the barriers? What are the defining principles around this? And, and part of it was using translational medicine, which was about now a couple of decades uh, that uh, has been adopted uh, as a discipline in, in the uh, medical re uh, community. Um, so we tried to formalize this. We did it through a set of articles and special issues, and we defined uh, translational computer science as a research that bridges foundational, use-inspired, and applied research with the delivery and deployment of outcomes, right? So that's a big part of it is, is not only doing the research, but really coming up with products, right? Of some form that comes out of this and presenting it to the target community. But I think the most important part is the interplay between these two pieces, the delivery of outcomes with the feedback coming up from the end user community, right? And we felt that this is becoming increasingly important given that computing and data uh, the research that we do as a community impacts all aspects of science, of society, and is becoming increasingly impactful, in, has an increasingly important role, right? So if you can understand this, we can probably maybe accelerate or amplify those impacts, right? And so that was sort of our, our idea uh, in trying to formalize uh, this, uh, this idea. And it was clearly complementary to things that were already going on, right? The idea was how do we understand what the barriers are and then see how we can try to get, for example, reward structure set up or recognition set up for doing this research and help um, you know, the uh, early career researchers trying to do to, to make things easier for them. Right? And so we tried to formalize it based on the definitions of, of uh, translational medicine around these concepts of laboratory, locale, and community. And, and, and there's a couple of papers uh, uh, that we, we published that sort of go into some more detail out here. And just to explain this, uh, let me use uh, what better tool than a workflow to describe it, right? So this is really what we do in, in more uh, traditional research, right? We start with some idea, some real world problem. We define it in as some abstract problem definition. Uh, we typically propose some solution, whether it's an algorithm, it's a software system, um, it, right? It's, it's, it's something else. So we define a solution. We often prototype it in some form uh, and evaluate it. And, and you know, there's a loop in there, but we are continuously refining it based on my evaluation. It could be experimental. It could be uh, analytical evaluations. And then once we are satisfied, we publish it. And we do that as papers. Uh, but also as code and data, uh, and then sometimes we might decide to commercialize it, right? So this is really what defines a lot of the foundational, use-inspired, applied research that, that we do. 
And, and what translational research um, does is adds another loop, right? And another iteration where we actually um, take the, uh, the results of our research, but take them back to the real world, right? And apply them to the real world to solve real problems, right? And, and, and then learn from that and iterate on refining the problem definition and the solution space based on the feedback we're getting from the real world, where it's deployed at scale in a real world setting, right? Uh, and the key differentiator is that this is not throwing it over the fence, but integrating it into the, into the research process, right? So this part of, of the transition to practice deployment in the real world is part of the research process itself. Right, so when I propose it, I integrate, I involve, include that in my proposal, in my definition, uh, in my uh, research plan. Right, and I think that's a big differentiator. We've done some case studies around this. What we've been doing is looking at people in the community, our, our colleagues who have been doing this work and understanding, right, how have they done it and where are the barriers. And it, it's, it's, it's surprising to see how many of the lessons learned are very similar uh, across many diverse efforts, right? So what I want to do in, in the next few slides is how I've used this idea of, uh, of translational research, this kind of workflow on some of the work that we've been doing on end-to-end -end workflows. Um, so this is one of the workflows we have been working on, and this is part of a, a, a collaboration uh, in the area of, uh, of, of fusion that we've been working with uh, uh, for almost a, well over a decade, I think right now uh, in, in various forms. Uh, this is with folks over at PPPL, the Pro Princeton Plasma Physics Lab at Oak Ridge National Lab and, and, and many other uh, collaborators as most recently as part of the whole device modeling uh, ECP project, right? Uh, the idea here is to do a, a couple simulation of, of the core and the edge of the plasma, and then uh, couple that with experiments going uh, going on at a, at a tokamak. And there's a different levels of thing going on. In this particular example on this slide, we're trying to, uh, as the experiment goes on, you're trying to um, do uh, data collection uh, uh, of different parameters as part of the experiment, uh, be able to visualize that and do some diagnostics on it to be able to predict uh, anomalies. And the idea here is to improve the efficiency of the experiments, but also prevent things that might potentially damage the tokamak, right? And so this means grabbing um, data, uh, creating images, uh, comparing them, using those images to drive the analytics running on the, uh, on the computers, and then feeding this back. Now, this is not very different in terms of structure than some of the examples I heard uh, yesterday, right? And so we sort of split this into two problems. One is looking at in-situ workflows that really target how do we uh, run things, uh, the two separate codes representing the core and the edge of the plasma and run them on the same large uh, supercomputer uh, at the same time, right? And these are two distinct codes developed by distinct communities. And how do you really couple them as part of an in-situ workflow and possibly run some in-situ data analytics, in-situ visualization over there? And this, as was pointed out again yesterday, there's some challenges here, right? We are, how do you take, you know, how do you define this in a, in a way? How do you define this uh, coupling or the interactions in a workflow uh, in a way that it has the flexibility doing execution uh, on these systems, which which you know which are operated right as a single task running. Right? How do you take care of contingencies? How do you take care of of uh, of, uh, of uh, problems or performance aspects or uh, and things like that? Right? So having the right abstraction to build these uh, these interactions in this workflow is often challenging. Right? Um, and so again, without going into too much detail. Uh, our approach is as uh, part of a, a system called data spaces, which uh, builds on a shared space, tuple space model, implements it in a scalable way and runs it as a service and uses there that as a mechanism to couple these multiple entities on these extreme scale systems. Right? So it runs on using resources, cores, uh, 
uh, dedicated nodes on the system. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, scalable or elastic in that sense. It runs on these systems and then different uh, components can connect to it, uh, put or get data, and it, that's, a, that's a way to share information and, and do the, both the coordination as well as the data exchange in these in-situ workflows. And, and there's a, you know, we've been talking about it for some time, so there's a lot of different aspects of it, but at a high level, it just provides an abstraction that allows us to really uh, define these interactions in, in, in an effective way. Uh, and then we've used it for, for a bunch of uh, different types of workflows. We've used it, for example, to increase the frequency of analytics uh, that we could run. Uh, in, the, in the example on the left was some work we did with Jackie Chan's group as part of a, a, a combustion uh, collaboration. Uh, and, and really what it was doing is that, you know, we, were, we found that we could uh, run simulations at very, very high resolutions, right? But because of the IO challenge, uh, we could only analyze them at say, you know, if you could you know, every 400, uh, time step, right? So we're losing a lot of the resolution. And we found that if you can move these analytics as an in-situ workflow, you can do the analytics very often, including possibly at every time step with very little impact, right? So it just allowed us to really leverage the high resolutions we get at extreme scale. Uh, the second example here is doing this in-situ simulation uh, for the core edge. And this is an ongoing project, but again, we can use these kind of in-situ workflows to do these complex uh, coupling problems, right? But one feedback we got from translation, and I know I'm only two minutes away, so I'll go through this quickly, uh, was that uh, um, data movement, data placement in an in-situ workflow is important. It depends on you know where the data is and how do you move it close to uh, where it's needed, right? How can we... Uh, be a little more intelligent about how do you couple things, right? The second feedback we found out is often the execution of the workflow depends on the data, right? And so uh, what analytics you run, for example, and how much, re how many resources they need depends on what the data is saying that I don't know a priori, right? And so that means adjusting where I run the analytics, uh, how, how many resources I allocate to it has to change over time. And, and we have to be able to do something more smart uh, in, in the runtime to be able to support it. So I'm gonna flash four slides and literally flash them because I don't have time just to talk about some work that has been done in this space uh, by a group, right? One is uh, looking at how I can use machine learning te techniques to learn what's going on and be able to move data closer at higher levels of memory or closer to nodes in anticipation of its being used, right? Uh, and then we took it a step further to really push it to the nodes, anticipating that it's going to need it. And rather than waiting for it, we can learn and then push it together. And again, here it's leveraging the fact that these workflows have natural localities in space and time that we can leverage. And so we tried and looked at, in this case, we used an n-gram machine learning model to do this. And then we use machine learning again to be able to manage where, how the data flows to minimize impacts. Right. The other piece of work that was done by uh, Zhe Wang was to see how we can come up with a more data-driven approach to run these workflows. Uh, finally, uh, in the and I, I expected that I wouldn't have time, so I just wanted to put it here. We are sort of extending this abstraction to the work uh, wide area. This includes how do you do this not only in the in situ but also. Uh, between the experiment and extend this abstraction along with some event-driven models to do end-to-end data-driven computations. Um, I'm going to skip the last two slides in the interest of time and just end with this. So part of this goal was to you know, use it in my own research, but also start collecting uh, examples from the community on how they have done translation and what were the lessons learned as they tried to incorporate real world deployments into their research pro progress. So if you're interested in contributing, we're running a, a department in case studies in translation computer science. These are short articles uh, and, they, and the requirement is you don't talk about the cool research you're doing, you talk about how you did it. How did you have the impact with your work 
that you ha are having, right? What were the barriers? What are the lessons learned? And how can others have that kind of impact uh, on, on, on the real world, on real applications? Let me stop there. Thank you for the opportunity. And if we have time, I'll be happy to take questions.